From the evolution of the hockey puck to an NHL team drafting a player that just straight up didn't exist, there's a lot I bet you didn't know about the NHL. For example, did you know a player was traded for a single dollar? Yep, that's right, you heard me correct, one measly dollar. There's a lot to cover in this video, so let's jump right in. Here are 20 NHL facts you didn't know. The NHL's first ever outdoor game. I bet you didn't know that the NHL debuted outdoor hockey for the first time back in 1954 in an exhibition game between the Detroit Red Wings and, wait for it, an amateur hockey team made up of prison inmates. The team was called the Marquette Prison Pirates. During a promotional tour in 1953, the Detroit Red Wings GM Jack Adams and team captain Ted Lindsay visited the Marquette Branch Prison. After a tour of the correctional facility, the warden invited the Red Wings back to play against the ragtag team of prison inmates. Thinking it would never happen because the prison had no rink, the GM agreed but was shocked a few months later when the warden ended up calling saying the arrangements have been made. The Red Wings GM honored his agreement and plans were made for the Red Wings to travel to Marquette to play a game on February 2nd, 1954 on an outdoor rink at the prison. This would mark the first outdoor game in NA NHL history. Although some prison officials were worried about putting hockey sticks in the hands of convicted felons, the Red Wings were not that worried. Captain Ted Lindsay said, I was never concerned because I figured that I could take care of myself. The entire inmate population turned out to see Lindsay, Terry Sawchuk, Red Kelly, Gordie Howe, and the rest of the team take the ice against the Marquette Prison Pirates. The prison pirates, however, were no match for the Red Wings. Detroit goalie Terry Sawchuk spent most of the game sitting on top of his net, and at one point, he even left the ice to sign some autographs. At the end of the first period, the score of the game was 18 to nothing for the Red Wings. The Art Ross Trophy so if you're an avid hockey fan, you know at the end of every season, the Art Ross Trophy is awarded to the NHL's top scorer. Now, naturally, one would believe that Art Ross himself must have been an unbelievable goal scorer during his time in the NHL. I mean, the trophy is named after him, so it only makes sense. Well, that's actually not the case whatsoever. Art Ross was not an explosive goal scoring forward. He was in fact a defenseman and making this even more bizarre, Art Ross actually only played three games in the NHL with the Montreal Wanderers when they joined the NHL for its inaugural season in the 1917-18 season. So how many goals and points does Art Ross have? A devastatingly low one goal in three games played. The St. Louis Blues 1983 Draft Throughout the history of the NHL, we have seen some pretty terrible draft mistakes, but none come close to what the 1983 St. Louis Blues did. It is downright embarrassing. Some draft classes have been total duds, teams have missed on great players, and sometimes even the first overall pick has been a failure. But rarely have NHL teams simply refused to select players in the draft. Yet, that is exactly what the St. Louis Blues did at the 1983 draft. Before we get into the why, let's backtrack and give some context. The Blues joined the NHL in the first expansion of six teams back in 1967. With hockey legends like Al Arbor, Red Berenson, and Mr. Goalie Glenn Hall part of their original lineup, the St. Louis Blues established itself as the best of the new crop of six teams. That earned them the honor of advancing to the Stanley Cup Final in each of their three first seasons. The Blues' initial owners were the Solomon family, who oversaw most of a decade of success for the expansion franchise with growing attendance and expanding revenue. But by the end of that decade, the franchise began to struggle. The 1978-79 season remains arguably the worst season in franchise history as the team managed just 18 wins. Despite the arrival of players that would become franchise greats like Bernie Federico, Brian Sutter, and Wayne Babick, the team still continued to struggle on the ice. The owners of the Blues desperately wanted out. So a group called Batoni Hunter Enterprises Limited was making moves in Saskatoon and wanted to bring the St. Louis Blues to Saskatchewan. The group claimed to be ready to break ground on an 18,000 seat venue in Saskatchewan at the price of $43 million. They offered the Blues owners $12 million for the franchise and they accepted. Everything was finalized for the sale except the NHL's approval. The NHL was concerned with long-term franchise viability. They did not believe Saskatoon would be able to sustain an NHL franchise even with a brand new stadium, so the Board of Governors rejected the attempted sale by a vote of 15 to 3. 
So after a $60 million antitrust lawsuit in U.S. District Court against the owners and against the president of the NHL, the Blues owner went even further, announcing that he was effectively abandoning the franchise, giving it to the NHL to operate, sell, or otherwise dispose of in whatever manner the league desires. The 1983 NHL draft was scheduled just five days after this announcement. In limbo, the Blues officials traveled to Montreal at their own expense, completely in the dark as to what state their franchise is in. The news shocked the NHL world as the Blues owners forbade the executives from selecting players for their team at the draft. The Blues remain the only team to ever abandon a draft completely. The Blues missed out on some top-tier talent in Pat LaFontaine going third overall, followed by Steve Eiserman at the fourth pick. The cheapest trade in NHL history. The Detroit Red Wings acquired one of their biggest role players of the 1990s and 2000s in Chris Draper for, you guessed it, $1. The Wings paid just $1 to the Winnipeg Jets for Draper who was drafted in the third round 62nd overall by the Jets in 1989. While he was never the most offensive player, Draper became a huge part in the Red Wings' success during his tenure. His best offensive season came in the 2003-2004 season when he tallied career highs with 24 goals and 40 points. He only recorded 361 points in 1,137 career regular season games played for the Red Wings, but it was what he did without the puck that made him such a valuable piece. From 2000 to 2009, he was continuously in the Selkie conversation. With that being said, he took home the award in the 2003-2004 season and was even in the Hart conversation, finishing 28th in voting. His success continued in the playoffs with the Red Wings when he had 46 points in 220 games en route to four Stanley Cups. That included back-to-back -back wins in the 97-98 seasons, with the other two coming in 2002 and 2008. Not too bad for spending only one single dollar. The Buffalo Sabres drafted a player who didn't exist. Now this has to be the biggest trolling job to ever happen in the NHL. The Buffalo Sabres made history in the 1974 NHL draft when they drafted a player who didn't exist. The bizarre incident occurred in the 11th round of the draft when the Sabres selected a player named Taro Sujimoto of the Japanese Hockey League. The selection of Sujimoto was met with confusion and disbelief by fans and officials alike. There was no record of a player named Taro Sujimoto ever having played in Japan and some speculated that the pick was a joke or a mistake. It was later revealed that the selection of Sujimoto was in fact a hoax perpetrated by the Sabres GM. He had grown frustrated with the length of the draft and decided to have some fun by creating a fictitious player. The pick was not discovered to be a hoax until several weeks later when the NHL received a letter from Tokyo denying the existence of Taro Sujimoto. The NHL then invalidated the pick and removed Sujimoto from the Sabres draft list. Despite the embarrassment caused by the incident, the Sabres went on to have a successful 1974-75 season, finishing first in the league's Eastern Conference. The team went on to reach the Stanley Cup Finals where they were ultimately defeated by the Philadelphia Flyers. The Evolution of the Hockey Puck Rumor has it that the earliest hockey pucks were actually just frozen pieces of cow manure. I think it's safe to say we're all thankful they came up with better materials for pucks. Fast forward to the 2020 playoffs and the NHL began using sensors in the pucks to gather more data about the game and enhance the viewing experience for fans. The sensors are embedded in the pucks and provide information about the puck's speed, trajectory, and distance traveled on the ice. The data is collected by sensors placed around the rink, which use radio frequency technology to communicate with the puck sensors in real time. The use of puck sensors is part of the NHL's larger effort to embrace technology and data analytics to enhance the game of hockey. The data collected by sensors can be used to provide new insights in player performance, team strategies, and even the physics of the game itself. The puck speed data can be used to analyze how different shots and passes affect the game, and the trajectory of data can help coaches and players improve their positioning and defensive strategies. The sensors have also been used to create new viewing experiences for fans. During the playoffs, the NHL introduced a puck tracking feature on its website and mobile app, which allowed fans to see real-time data about the the puck's movement on the ice. This feature provides a new level of insight and analysis for fans, and it has been praised for its ability to enhance the viewing experience, making the game more engaging. 
Manen Rayom. She did not intend to be the only girl on her youth teams, the first girl to play in the famed Quebec International Pee Wee Tournament, and the first girl to play in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. There were not many options for girls to play hockey in the 1980s and the 1990s. Manon Rayom had to compete against the boys if she wanted to play at all, and she was determined to play. She also did not intend to make history, but she couldn't say no when the expansion Tampa Bay Lightning invited her to their training camp after she helped Canada win the gold at the 1992 Women's World Championships. She played one period of an exhibition for the Tampa Bay Lightning against the St. Louis Blues on September 23rd, 1992, becoming the first woman to suit up for an NHL game. Cancelling the Stanley Cup Series Going all the way back to the 1919 Stanley Cup Final, the league had to cancel the postseason after being five games into the Stanley Cup Finals due to a worldwide Spanish flu epidemic that made its way into the league. It remains one of just two years in the NHL's history that the Stanley Cup was not awarded. The second was because of the 2004-2005 NHL lockout. In the late 1910s, the NHL was still very much in its infancy. At that point, the champions of the NHL and the rival Pacific Coast Hockey Association competed for the Stanley Cup. Now because both teams used different sets of rules, they alternated between each league's rules every other game throughout the series. The Montreal Canadiens and the Seattle Metropolitans were facing off but had to cancel their series, marking the first time the Stanley Cup was not awarded. The series was tied 2-2-1, but the final game was never played because Montreal players Joe Hall, Billy Cotu, Jack McDonald, Edward Lalonde, and manager George Kennedy were hospitalized with influenza. Joe Hall ended up passing away four days after the cancelled game, and the series was abandoned. The most bizarre trade attempt in league history. There have been a lot of bizarre trades to happen in the NHL, but this one would have taken the cake had it gone through. Peter Pocklington, the former Edmonton Oilers owner, who in 1988 infamously dealt Wayne Gretzky to the LA Kings, had another outlandish trade in mind. Pocklington claims to have been approached by former Toronto Maple Leafs owner Harold Ballard about potentially trading arenas. Ballard was in the midst of financial problems, so he essentially offered up the historic Maple Leaf Gardens in return for the Oilers' home arena in Edmonton and $50 million in cash. Could you imagine the Leafs would have to play in Edmonton and the Oilers would be playing in Toronto? Pocklington was excited by the idea of a market change, believing that he would make a fortune in Toronto. Then, for a reason unbeknownst to Pocklington, Ballard ended up backing out of the deal. Penguin Pete Unfortunately, this is a pretty sad story. Back in the late 1960s, Penguins owner Jack McGregor had an idea to use a live mascot during games. Penguin Pete came on loan from the Pittsburgh Zoo and McGregor wanted to see if the Ecuadorian penguin could actually learn how to skate. They actually ordered custom skates from CCM to accommodate the penguin's unique leg and foot structure. Of course, this did not work out and Pete ended up coming down with pneumonia. He was returned to the Pittsburgh Zoo and died soon after. Throwing octopus on the ice. Throwing octopus on the ice at hockey games has become a unique tradition, specifically in the city of Detroit. So how did this all start? The origin of the famous Detroit octopus throw is traced to 1952, when during the third game of the final series against the Montreal Canadiens, Pete Cusimano, an east side fish market owner, celebrated the first Red Wings goal by throwing an octopus onto the ice. The Wings ended up winning the game and the series, and Cusimano reportedly claimed that his sacrificial octopus had influenced the outcome. Since then, Cusimano showed up to every Wings home playoff game with an octopus in hand, tossing it on the ice at the first Red Wing goal. Women on the Stanley Cup There are 12 women named on the Stanley Cup, all of them being owners or team executives. Marjorie Norris, the president of the Detroit Red Wings from the 1954-55 season, was the first woman to have her name engraved on the cup. Sonia Scurfield, the co-owner of the Calgary Flames in 1989, is in fact the only Canadian woman to have her name on the Stanley Cup. The first NHL player to make $1 million In 1971, the Boston Bruins signed Bobby Orr to a five-year deal worth $200,000 per year. This was the first million-dollar contract signed in NHL history. Bobby Orr ended up scoring 181 goals over that time and was obviously well worth the money spent. The shortest player in NHL history 
Standing at only 5'3", he was the NHL's smallest ever goalie and was nicknamed Shrimp. Roy Warders started his NHL career with the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1925 and spent three seasons with them before being traded to the New York Americans, where he stayed until his retirement in 1937. He was also the first goalie to use the backhand side of his stick to deflect shots into the corners. He ended up winning the Hart Trophy in the 1928-29 season and the Vesna Trophy for the 1930-31 season. Roy Warders was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1969. The fastest shot in NHL history. Bobby Hall reportedly holds the record for the fastest slap shot ever recorded at 118 miles per hour, but that was back when technology wasn't very sophisticated. His wrist shot was clocked at 105 miles per hour. Nicknamed the Golden Jet, Hall spent 23 seasons in the NHL playing for the Chicago Blackhawks, the Winnipeg Jets, and the Hartford Whalers. The fastest slap shot recorded in modern times with modern technology was from Zdeno Chara with a wicked 108.8 miles per hour monster slap shot in the 2012 All-Star Skills Competition. Goalie Goals Billy Smith, the former goalie for the New York Islanders, is the first goalie to be credited with scoring a goal. Smith scored a goal on November 28, 1979. Then, Philadelphia Flyers former goalie Ron Hextel is the second goalie to score a goal, but the first to score by taking his own shot. Including Hextall and Smith, 11 goalies have scored goals in the NHL. Martin Brodeur has the most goals by a goalie with three, two coming in the regular season, and one in the playoffs. Face-offs. If you're like me, watching a linesman drop a puck at the face-off dot can be so annoying to watch, especially if they continuously kick out the centerman for reasons I never really understand. But what I bet you didn't know is before 1914, referees had to actually place the puck onto the ice between both center sticks. So instead of just dropping it, they would have to bend down and place the puck down onto the ice. This, of course, resulted in cuts, bruises, fractures, and breaks for the referees. The rule was passed in 1914. 14 that the referee could then drop the puck between the two sticks to avoid those injuries. Emergency Backup Goalies According to Rule 5.3 of the NHL rulebook, the backup goalie must be fully dressed and prepared to enter the game whenever necessary. This rule also dictates that no skater aside from the designated goalie can put on goalie equipment unless both of the team's regular netminders are unavailable. In situations where both of the team's goalies are unable to continue playing, the team is permitted to field any available goalie to take their place. More often than not, this substitute goalie is the emergency backup goalie already Already present in the arena and well prepared for such an unexpected call to action. If the team has no option for a backup, they can literally choose anyone to suit up and play, including the fans. Spelling errors on the Stanley Cup. You would think that something as important as engraving names onto the Stanley Cup would be done with a little more attention to detail. There are two dozen engraving errors on the Stanley Cup, including misspelling of Boston, the Toronto Maple Leafs, and the New York Islanders. Only one of the errors is not a spelling error. When the Oilers won the Cup in the 83-84 season, owner Peter Pocklington had his dad's name snuck onto the team's roster. The NHL caught the error later on and had his father's name crossed out with X's. Extreme weight loss. With ice hockey being as fast paced and intense as it is, you may wonder how many calories the players are burning over a 60 minute game. Though players tend to only be on the ice for relatively short shifts around 45 seconds, they're playing at a high intensity and getting their heart rates up. As a result, hockey burns a significant amount of calories in a short period. Jesse Demare, who was the strength and conditioning coach for the New York Islanders, measured the calorie expenditures of players and came to the conclusion that on average, players are burning through 1,800 to 2,500 calories per game. This can depend on a player's position and how many minutes they get on the ice during an average game. Due to the significant amount of sweat that most NHL players lose during the game, they may lose anywhere from 5 to 8 pounds by the end of the night. Sergei Bobrovsky of the Florida Panthers frequently loses 15 to 20 pounds during an NHL game. However, most of the weight loss is water weight and the goaltender can put that back on relatively quick. Thanks for watching our videos. Don't forget to leave a like and if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button.